I'm going to present uh, is community driven AI music research a thing? And it's going to be a post mortem analysis of open source research. So, what is open source research? Well, this is a, a community driven a research project, and I want to talk a little bit about it. And, and here you have an overview of the different points that I'm going to be touching upon. First of all, I'm going to give you an overview of the project itself, the way we organized the project, the different phases, some advice that came from ex comes from experience, and finally, some final thoughts. Let's get started with the project itself. So what's open source research? Well, this has been a community driven research project in AI music creativity. So we followed the concepts of open science, open source, crowdsourcing, everything has been online. And the main goal was to produce output, which was usable by um, the community, the music community. Now, people came from all over the world and they came from the Sound of AI community. So what's the Sound of AI community? Well, as Stefano said, it's the largest AI music community uh, online. So we have 30,000 people on YouTube, 6,000 on the Sound of AI Slack. And we talk about all things AI music audio speech. We have hackathons, knowledge transfer tutorials, so on and so forth. Now, the main question that I had when starting this uh, project was this one. Is it possible to run high quality research with a community? Now, we try to answer this question with this uh, project and we settled on this particular project. So we wanted to create a neural audio synthesizer that generates guitar sounds from voice instructions. I'm not going to get into the details of this um, sort of like uh, the technical details of the project because this has been published here at AIMC and uh, Amit, one of my colleagues, is going to present the results uh, in a couple of days. So I'm not going to touch on that. Rather, I just want to give you an overview of the sort of like the backstage and how we organize all of this. Now, OSR, open source research in numbers, 1.5 years to go through all of it. 300 people sub uh, subscribed to, to, to this project, more than 150 active researchers. We had 54 authors in the paper, seven research groups, seven co coordinators and 10 co-coordinators, two project managers and one project leader. So it's a lot of people. And we had a lot of output as well. One paper, a desktop app with neural synthesizer, web app, a new guitar sound taxonomy, new Python library for spectral analysis, new data sets, tools for active learning, project website and paper companion website. So a lot of output out of this, but we had a lot of challenges. So first of all, a lot of people to coordinate, more than 150, as you've seen different levels of expertise. Some people were uh, professionals, other academics, other were just like amateurs or like bachelor degrees with different backgrounds. And the other big problem was decentralization. Now, how did we manage all of that complexity? I'm going to try to answer that in this second section, organization. So we had a hierarchical structure. So I was leading the project. Then we had all the researchers, but we needed some level of like organization here. So we had research coordinators, which would actually coordinate a team of research. We also had co-coordinators. So who are these co-coordinators? Well, you can think of them as Batman and Robin, right? So one supports the other. And we also had project managers who uh, sort of like overviewed the entire uh, project. Each of these units here is a research group that has some researchers, a coordinator and a co-coordinator or multiple co-coordinators. So this is a unit of research. And we had several, seven to be precise, research groups. So one for speech to text, one for text to sound, sound generation, production, music data set, and evaluation. Again, I'm not going to get into the details here, but this is like a way of dividing our neural synthesizers of the work into sort of like manageable units of work. Now, the question is, so how do you have multiple groups working on a single paper? Well, the idea is that of a uh, modular synthesizer, right? So you have different blocks that do different things, and then they have some interfaces that connect uh, one group with the other. And indeed, we used this idea of divide and conquer for the different groups. We had a modular topic, this neural synthesizer with voice instructions and text analysis, like and all of that. And so we had a bunch of different groups. So for example, music generation was responsible for generating, uh, well, sound generation, I should say, for generating sound. We had some some text analysis, some speech to text. And so as you can see, it's all divided into different units. Now, 
uh, a key part was communication here. And we did that with a lot of like online and offline uh, things. And some of the online, of course, were meetings and we had different types of meetings. So we had community meetings with all the people every one or two weeks that depended on the face of the projects. Then we had weekly coordinators meeting where I was there, the PMs, the project managers were there and the research coordinators just to coordinate the high level uh, work and understanding what uh, everyone was doing. Then we had research group meetings, which were completely up to the research coordinators to uh, organize and to the researchers to attend. Then there were also researchers meetings, so like two or three people who would just meet up and organize. So the last two were uh, really about like bottom up self-organization. Now, what management tools did we use? Well, we used the A mailing list for community-wide updates and to schedule like general meetings. Then uh, the, the, the sort of like uh, the, 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 the tool that we used the most was Slack. We had three different channels, one for the overall community, one only for the coordinators, co-coordinators, and the other one for project managers. And then we had a Google Drive shared folder where we stored resources, planning uh, material, and uh, yeah, we would write drafts and keep tracks uh, of members and stuff like that, like this. Then moving on, we also had Google Meet for community meetings. And finally, we used Discord for distributed video sessions. Discord is just fantastic if you want to have multiple video calls or rooms like in parallel. And for example, we use this to select uh, the topic where different people would present different topics at the same time and people could hop in and up off. And finally, we had GitHub where we collaborated with the code. And here you have like the, the repository which a lot of code that we created across all the seven different research groups. Okay, another big problem, copyright. So all the work that we've created and knowledge produced like code, data sets, algorithms is distributed using the MIT license. And another really, really big problem is credits. So how do you credit a community with potentially hundreds of people? Well. Uh, we couldn't do this, right? Because basically this is the sound of the uh, community and that's what would happen, right? Too many people, right? So what did we do? Well, we used the credits system. We credited all community members based on the type of contribution that they provided. Offers, the main offer here that you can see in the paper is the community itself. And then we use the credit, this uh, contributor's role taxonomy that you can see here. Well, sorry, I don't know why it's not opening. But this is just like a framework to credit uh, people and tell like what they've done. And we put like all the, the authors back in an appendix, dedicated appendix with more than 50 people here. Okay, so let's go to the different project phases. So we divided the project into different phases and we had some planning requirements. First of all, we want to account for both research and uh, development. We want something that would be a enough flexible to change things in due course, but at the same time, we want a clear step-by-step -step plan because it's a lot of people to organize. So should we go agile? Should we go waterfall? Well, we decided to do both really. So we went waterfall in that we created an overall plan with a lot of different phases that would give us structure, but at the same time, we used agile within each of the different phases so that we had enough agility, flexibility to change things in due course. So let me give you, I rundown of the different phases that we went through. So an initial one was preparation, where we just organized in teams, we selected coordinators, core coordinators, then we selected the topic that we wanted to work on. Well, we didn't have any topic at the beginning. So this came out naturally, sort of like emerged from the community itself. Then we did some massive literature review. We designed the solution in all of its different uh, implementations. And then we uh, implemented the solution. We evaluated the solution. We went through a write-up process, then we submitted. We received very, very good uh, reviews. And we applied sort of like the different provisions that reviewers asked us to implement. And then, yeah, that was it. The, the project is this one. Seems like quite short and all of that, but it took a lot of time, as I mentioned, so 1.5 years. Now, some advice and things that we've learned and mistakes that we've done. Well, first of all, we felt like that our plans were like super, super strong, but reality told us, well, they weren't really super, super strong. So we had to sort of like readapt based on what came out during the process. So some pitfall and possible 
best practices to address them. So we were super optimistic when we were planning. So we thought, well, it's going to take us like probably six to eight months. Well, no, it took us 1.5 years. So generally, like you are super optimistic when you plan stuff. So try to use three times the initially uh, sort of like plan time. So th this is like a good rule of thumb. Then another like major issue. So integrating work from different groups can be uh, a hassle. It's integration hell. It's a major, major issue. So what should, should you do and should we do? Well, establish interfaces. This is something that we've done, but we haven't adopted early testing across different research groups to integrate the work. But indeed, we fostered intergroup communication. So all of these three things are very, very important to uh, integrate work from different sources. Then third pitfall research group that depends too much on a single contributor. The single contributor can just like fade out because life. So you have to be prepared for that. And indeed, it's important to create redundancy within these research groups. And in order to do that, we can have a lot of like frequent or frequent knowledge transfer sessions so that yeah, you have redundancy. So not everything depends on a single person. Now, some uh, additional advice. Well, be prepared to change plans. Things are going to go south a lot of times and you have to be super agile and be prepared to change things. You have to find a core management team you can fully trust. This is, uh, to be a bit more specific, you need super strong project managers and super strong research coordinators you can fully trust to do their work independently. It's just impossible to sort of like overview the work of 150 people. You have to establish clear processes and workflows to guide contributors. So it, it, you have to understand that here, we didn't have like people fully committed in this project because it wasn't like a full-time job, which is like something that people would do like on their spare time. So it's extremely important to have like clear processes and workflows to avoid sort of like dissipating energy and dissipating focus. You have also to account for contributors who, who will fade in, fade out. Yeah, so I think like overall we had, it's difficult to, to track, but possibly more than 200 people who at some point worked on the project. But yeah, you have to have a framework there to account for changes and people with, who will come in and get out. And one of those things is to document everything so that newcomers can just like read what has happened. And finally, uh, be prepared to step in when project stalls. There may be certain lows in the project, and so you have to step in and uh, yeah, move the project ahead. Some final thoughts. Well, let's go back to the initial question. Is it possible to run high quality research with a community? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. But is it easy to run a community driven research project? Well, absolutely not. It's a huge, huge commitment. So here are some pros and cons of community driven research. The quality of research is stunning. Even if you don't have like super expert uh, people, but the quality is going to be really, really good. The quantity and variety of output is incredible. So we could have easily written probably three, four different papers. We've settled on one for now. Uh, but yeah, people will produce a lot of like really, really good stuff. Everybody learns a ton. You can make friends, you can build strong sense of community. And finally, you are going to have like a huge impact because you're not just publishing because you have to publish because of academic pressure. Just you do it because you enjoy the process and you want something that may have an impact. Some uh, cons, the projects are long. Uh, the organization effort is massive. And if most motivation is lost, like the, the project can just like dissipate, completely die out. When should you consider community-driven research? Well, if you have a community that's eager to explore and it's passionate about that research topic, you should have from 20 to 30% experts in that subject area that you want to cover because otherwise it's going to be impossible to manage the whole thing. You need to have very good project management skills. And finally, you have significant time and willpower to invest in the project. So yeah, that's it. The, I hope like you enjoyed like this super quick like presentation to the idea. But here you have like my uh, contacts if you want to get in touch. Yeah, I'm curious to know. Oh, if you want to have like any chat or whatever like in this kind of stuff. And I think like we may have one question.